All right, here's the next excerpt I got for you guys. Let's play it back first, and then I'll break it down. All right, that's it. The one thing that looks really hard but is not that tricky is this run right here. Um, it's kind of just this little three note pattern just kind of repeating up. And another thing that looks really tough are these big chords. Uh, but in fact, most of these are just octaves with just a little harmony note thrown in the middle. And as we move ahead here, this part took some time to transcribe, trying to figure out what was the rhythm, what was the pocket, how should it really feel. And so we got some accents there. That's really going to give you that syncopated, groovy, funky kind of sound that Hiromi is known for. There is, of course, a really neat like cycle or like a sequence going on here where everything's going up whole step, half step, whole step, half step, kind of like in a diminished scale type of deal. And then at the very end, we got this very Chick Corea-ish sounding little cluster of notes. We got the E and the F, which already sounds like total filth. And then we put this G sharp in there. It's like, oh God, please just make it stop. But actually, this is not that disgusting of a chord if you think about it, because where are we going? We're going to... We're going to A. And if you know anything about harmony and, and five chords and one chords, the E is actually the fifth in A minor. So there's the root position E chord. E, G sharp, B. It's not even that complex. We're taking out the B, and then we're just kind of putting in this, like, we're putting in this wrong note. It just sounds wrong, right? So you can borrow that and use that somewhere else, maybe. It, it kind of makes it feel like a diminished chord or like a, like, a, like a flat nine or something. So, for instance, if we're in C major, we could do the same exact thing. And there it is. G chord root, third, and then just sprinkle some dirt on it. Let's jump into some of this more challenging stuff, shall we? Uh, the first big chord here is this one. Very open, very like ambient, grandiose. And so I'll give you the little fill-in ghost note stuff later, but we're going from here, which is, this is just D minor seven, E minor seven, same exact voicing. Then we got this cool thing, and I absolutely love this chord. You could maybe call that either a Debussy chord or a Keith Emerson chord. It's an octave with both the four and the five kind of slammed into it. But the interesting thing about this chord in particular is you can kind of play this chord on almost any scale degree in whatever key you're in, and it will sound amazing. So in this tune, we have F major 7, Sharp 11, which is this B here. But check it out. If I, if I keep the F down here in the bass, I can pretty much go all the way through the white keys with the same chord shape, and it will sound great. That one's a little weird, but it's still cool. That's all of them. So some of them sound a little more consonant than others, but we could go to another key. We could go to C major.
and just apply the same intervals up here in the chords. Perfect fourth, perfect fifth octave. Sounds amazing. Let's go through this little change here one more time. And then interesting, the left hand actually breaks up a little bit here. to the fifth and then we have the nine uh, along with the with the third here this a and there it is when you play it all together of course this is being pedaled so you hear all of these resonating together now moving forward there's the next kind of cool change that happens you're expecting another F major uh, F major 7 sharp 11 there but instead you get this F sharp minor 7 with this like 9 and the 11 in there and this is a really cool kind of deceptive cadence I guess you could call it it subverts your expectation and same exact chord in the right hand, same exact chord, same exact voicing. But again, this just goes to show you how versatile this crazy fourth, fifth thing is here. Now it's playing the minor seven, and the, the minor third, and the minor eleventh there. So very cool thing uh, going on there where she kind of switches out that bass note to give us F sharp minor. Now, as far as I can tell, all of the ghost notes in this section are based on the regular old chord voicing that you're already playing. Watch the right hand here. Watch the right hand first. Did you catch that? Okay, so here's what the left hand is doing. Four, five, six, seven. Five, six, seven. Okay, so we put those two things together. What we end up with is this nice little rhythmic like fill that happens between the big chords. All right, so, so we're already playing this. We're already playing that. And the ghost note just... The only challenge is really just landing the tenth because... It's a tenth, and it's huge, and it's kind of hard to land anyway. But, uh, so you got that. And so the voicing here and the, the, the fingering and such is not really that difficult, but what is difficult is really doing this convincingly and making it groove, keeping it in the pocket, not losing that one, not losing your count, keeping track of that group of seven that we're in here. I kind of lost it there, trying to count and play at the same time. Let me try that. One, two, three, four, and five, six, and seven. One, two, three. Okay, so you get my point, though, right? This is this is tricky, but the notes themselves are fairly simple. Moving forward, we have this like kind of Chopin-esque run, and. I mentioned this earlier, but it's kind of just a repeating pattern of these three notes, which, if you have a good memory, part of this exact chord that we just finished playing. Here's what this sounds like. We're basically just arpeggiating the notes uh, out of the chord that we just played. There it is. 
And really neat thing that happens at the end of this run. This is one of my favorite things to do because it kind of, kind of catches you off guard a little bit. Instead of just going up all the way, here's the shape again. Instead of going up all the way in order, right, it's a lot cooler, in my opinion, and in Hiromi's opinion, to rearrange these last two so it kind of snaps back down into that 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 sharp 11 up here. So again, here's the here's the shape of it. We're going in order, in order, but then boom, boom, takes us down. There's a really cool like locking kind of sound to it. And in context, and in my uh, sheet music here, I actually have this accented as you can see, and that accent there is because that is the snap. Ba -ba 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 -bong. Okay, same thing on the second one, the only difference is the bass. Same exact right hand. Now we get to a really cool part. Okay. What's going on with this? We have these shapes in the right hand, very, very similar shape to the, or this, this Debussy chord, you could call it. Very similar shape. Hiromi is getting a ton of mileage out of these little perfect fourths and perfect fifths. got the left hand moving right away. Great way to practice that, just. Now here, what I wanna do is, I wanna get my thumb to kind of lock up with that left hand. Thumb. So I'm using five, three, two on the chord, and then, bah, the thumb comes down. There's the thumb. You could also practice it like this. Just going back and forth with it until you get real comfortable with this part of your hand moving like a unit and then the thumb rocking to the other side. Okay. Now when we get back to the F, I put accents on the Fs here because this is what gives it that syncopated, groovy kind of feel. We're not accenting the thumb. We're accenting the two finger that comes right afterwards. So in slow motion here. Okay, uh, which again in, in E, you got a very similar shape here in the right hand. As we move up, you'll notice these fifths and fourths feel very similar in the hand as you play them, which is nice. Kind of makes it a little bit of a smoother ride as you're trying to learn this stuff. Uh, so we put all that together. Nice strong downbeat so that we have that right uh, convincingness to it. Quiet thumb. Whack the F. Whack the F again. All right, so you get this kind of James Brown breakbeat kind of feel. Second time, we go all the way up with the left hand. 
and move the chord up a whole step. So we've moved it up a whole step, but then after this next little ghost note, uh-oh, what is this now? When you hear this live, it's like, what is even happening? Because it doesn't just go half step, half step, or whole step, whole step, whole step. It's whole half, whole half, whole half, whole half as it goes up. There's the first one. Whole step, half step, whole step, half, whole, half, whole, really quickly, and then it's, I don't even think, I, I don't even think she really finishes this pattern here, I think it's just, and it ends with the nice dissonant, crazy, Chikoria-esque five chord that we talked about earlier. So we've covered this section, which is probably the trickiest, toughest uh, bit in this performance. But don't go anywhere, because there's still more yet to come. Before we get to the third and final excerpt here, make sure to hit that like button if you learned something so far. And... Uh, Subscribe to the Owen Adams Music channel. Hit the notification bell. Uh, share this video with all the musicians you know. And uh, leave me a comment, too. What's your favorite uh, thing that you've heard played by Hiromi? I've heard her do some jazz standards. I've heard her originals. I've been a fan for many years. But, man, this Olympics performance was like, oh, my goodness. i got to do a tutorial on this and break it down. So if you found it as interesting as I do... Definitely leave a comment down below.